Uh, today, I would like to talk about how we can uh, control the, the flow dynamics of solution to control the crystallization of thin films for flexible electronic uh, applications. So if we look at the history of electronics technology development, in the past, the focus has been on increasing the computing power and computing speed. And this has been done uh, by shrinking the size of transistors. But recently, the focus has shifted towards increasing the portability and uh, imparting multifunctionality into electronic devices, which has, of course, uh, enabled the explosion of the use of mobile devices in our daily lives. But I believe that in the future, and I'm sure that many of us also uh, are, would agree with me, that in the future, um, the electronics will move towards flexible electronics or even stretchable electronics. And this would enable a wide variety of novel applications like wearable electronics, skin attachable devices, and also uh, flexible or even stretchable displays. So again, uh, electronics are definitely moving towards mechanically deformable uh, devices. So what are some of the components that are needed in these mechanically deformable electronics? Now, there are many different uh, components that are needed as the previous uh, the speakers have mentioned. Here I've mentioned three that I'm currently working on. For example, we would need uh, field effect transistors to uh, process and amplify signals. We will need uh, some various types of sensors because for example, if we're working with wearable electronics, the, the main functionality of these wearable electronics uh, would be sensing. Also, we would need a mechanically durable electrodes as uh, previous uh, speakers have already uh, discussed. And the materials that I'm working with to enable these components are things like organic semiconductors for field effect transistor applications, metal organic frameworks for chemical sensing and also liquid metal for uh, electrode applications. And in the interest of time, uh, today I will focus my talk on the first two of these topics. Now to generate these devices, the first thing we need to do is generate a thin film. And we not only need to generate it, but we have to precisely control the properties of the thin film. And the reason for that is very obvious. For example, if we're working with organic semiconductors, we have to ensure that we have high crystallinity in the thin film, because if we have an amorphous film, for instance, uh, it would have a very high density of green boundaries and that would decrease the mobility of the thin film. Also, even if we are able to grow crystals, these organic crystals also have to be aligned along the same direction because uh, generally these organic crystals have anisotropic uh, nature. So again, to ensure high mobility and uniformity, well-aligned crystals are generally needed. If we're working with conductive organic, metal organic frameworks for gas sensing application, for instance, we would need to control things like thickness, uh, particle size, particle density. And also it would be nice to be able to embed uh, nano catalysts into the pores and be able to control how much we're imparting into them uh, because these properties would uh, determine the performance of the sensor uh, ultimately. So again, to ensure high performing thin films, we have to control the crystallization or the molecular assembly uh, very precisely. Now, my main focus is working on uh, solution-based materials, a uh, solution-based uh, coding techniques. So here I have listed uh, a general, some of the common uh, techniques that people use. Now, what I'm interested in particular are the meniscus guided coding techniques, which I have listed on the bottom here. And these are interesting because we can control the thin film properties 
by controlling the nucleation and growth rate uh, using the meniscus as a guide. Now, amongst these, I'm also particularly uh, interested in solution sharing technique. It's a technique uh, analogous to blade coating, except that we have a heated substrate and we sandwich a solution between a blade and a substrate. And as we move the blade or the substrate, we're able to generate thin foam uh, over a large area. Now, with respect to generating uh, organic field effect transistors, solution sharing has been used very uh, commonly, but there are some issues uh, with solution sharing. For instance, because we are pre-injecting the solution, uh, the solution volume and concentration will constantly change during solution sharing process. And this is going to degrade the uniformity of the devices. So here I have taken a real-time uh, side view image of the meniscus during solution shearing. Now this dotted line here is the initial curvature of the meniscus. And you can see that as we conduct solution shearing, the curvature of the meniscus changes due to volume, volume depletion. And this is of course going to also lead to concentration changes. And you can see that using normal solution sharing, the device performance uh, is very, it's non-uniform. So this is one uh, area that we need to solve. Also, there is not as much uh, fluid dynamic control, and we don't have as much understanding of how flow pattern affects thin film crystallization in real time. And this is very important to be able to precisely control the crystallization process. So in order to address these issues, uh, I came up with a technique known as continuous flow microfluidic channel embedded solution uh, shearing. And here the main, main idea is to embed microfluidic channels within the blade. And so therefore I'm able to continuously supply solution towards the meniscus so I can maintain constant volume and concentration. Also more importantly, I have embedded three-dimensional structures within the microfluidic channels. And this allows me to manipulate the flow pattern, the solution flow pattern. Also in collaboration with Professor Nam at Seoul National University, uh, we conducted fluid dynamic simulations. And also using high-speed in situ microscopy, uh, we have observed the flow pattern and also the crystallization process in real time, which enables us to uh, in depth, analyze uh, the, the link, the correlation between the flow pattern and the crystallization process. So the first, uh, so we did, looked at three different designs. So the first microfluidic design we looked at is the flat or FM, which is a channel without any patterning. Secondly, we, we looked at a pattern known as a uh, slanted groove or SGM which has pillars that are oriented 45 degrees with respect to the channel direction. And we also looked at staggered herringbone architecture where we have these asymmetric arrows that are staggered. What I mean by staggered is that the apex of these arrows are, are changing their position periodically. You can see that in the cross-sectional image, the pillars only occupy half of the cross-section. So let's see what the flow pattern looks like when flow, when solution flows along these three channels. So we first looked at the uh, pressure gradient and velocity vector field simulation. You can see that with the looking at the pressure gradient plot, the pressure is constant perpendicular to the flow direction, which implies that we have unidirectional laminar flow, which is indeed what we see here uh, in the velocity vector field simulation. Uh, we also have conducted simulation of SGM and using, uh, if you look at the velocity vector field, we have one large helical flow. So we, you can think of a large helical flow going across the channel. Now what's more interesting is the staggered herringbone architecture. So what you see here on the right-hand side is that we have inflow of of solution from the outside towards the inside. But because these arrows are asymmetric, 
we have what, what's known as asymmetric counter-rotating helical flow. Also, because the arrows are staggered, these flows get broken down into even smaller flows. So we have many different smaller flows that, are, that we are generating. So let me give you, let me uh, show you some simulation uh, to, for, for you guys to visualize. So for the SDM, I told you that we have one large helical motion. So what you see here is a cross-sectional image over one cycle. So you see that we have the particles that are uh, basically just uh, moving helically. So because of that, we have one staring vortex. But in the case of staggered herringbone, what we see is that, again, we have this counter-rotating flow. But in the middle, we have these flows get broken down into even smaller flows. So you can see that motion in the pathline simulation. Now, if you look at the cross-sectional pathline simulation, you can see that instead of having one vortex, we have many uh, steering board tie. So this kind of flow is uh, what's known as chaotic flow. It is uh, very stochastic in nature, but the difference between this and that of the turbulent flow is that the flow pattern is still deterministic, so we can simulate it. So next we looked at how this, um, we looked at the in situ microscopy of the flow pattern using uh, fluorescent particles that we have injected into the solution. Now in the case of SGM, uh, you can see that the particles are moving more or less unidirectionally. Uh, and this is because if you're looking at a small area, uh, the helical flow will look as if it's going uh, unidirectionally. So this is not all that interesting. But if we take a look at the staggered herringbone architecture, what you see is that instead of unidirectional flow, the particles, the fluorescent particles are moving very randomly in all directions. Of course, they're moving along one direction, but the individual particles are looking as if uh, they're moving randomly. So to quantify this, we have uh, used the high-speed microscopy and we were able to track individual particles at every millisecond intervals. And using this, we have found out that the, in terms of the slanted groove, and this is also true for the SFM case, the particles are moving unidirectionally along with the fluid, but the staggered herringbone uh, flow pattern, you can see that the particle velocity changes very drastically at every millisecond interval. So the important question here is how does the manipulation of the flow pattern affect the crystallization process? So ideally what we want, as I've mentioned in the introduction, is we want aligned crystal growth. So what we want is these crystals to be growing along with the moving contact line, along with the moving meniscus. But what we have observed is that generally we don't see this. What we see is firstly the meniscus, the contact line, the contact line is the boundary between the liquid and the solid and air. The contact line is actually not a straight line, but it's protruding at various regions. Secondly, the crystals don't grow simultaneously with the contact line in, in these regions. So you can see that this the region on the right and left-hand side are the protruded uh, solution. And and at these regions, the crystals do not grow simultaneously with the contact line. But what happens is that as the solution dries, you have very rapid crystal growth, basically chases the, the contact line. And when it does, we don't get a line growth, but rather we get randomly oriented crystal growth with dendritic growth formation. And this is not what we want if we want uniform device performance. So in a minute, I'll, 
I'll be able to show you what happens here on the right hand side. So here we see that nothing is happening, even with the moving contact line. But all of a sudden, we, we get this very random growth, very random and rapid growth of crystals. So to explain this, we can think of the mass transport rate. So what basically, uh, because we have insufficient mass transport, we don't have enough uh, solute being supplied to the growing end of the crystal. Therefore, the crystal growth gets suspended. So this is the reason for this protruded regions. But as the solvent dries, uh, we get supersaturated state at which we have rapid uh, high nucleation and growth rate. And in this regime, we're going to get random dendritic isotropic crystal growth. Now, let's see what happens if we use the SHM. So in this case, uh, we get the idealized situation where the crystals are growing uh, along with the contact line and they're uh, more or less very well aligned. So you can see that in the case of SHM, the crystals are growing very um, uniformly and also unidirectionally along with the contact line uh, simultaneously. So this can be explained analogously, analogously to, the, to the previous discussion, where we have sufficient supply of solute to the growing crystal. And so therefore, we're able to uh, maintain what's known as the saturated state, where crystal growth is favored, but the nucleation is suppressed. So in this case, the crystal is able to continuously grow, grow along with the moving uh, meniscus contact line. So if you look at cross-polarized microscopy images, we see that the, in terms of the SHM, we get very well-aligned crystals. Whereas in the case of FM, also true for SGM, uh, the crystal growth is very randomly oriented. And if you look at the GIXD, Grayson incident X-ray diffraction patterns, uh, we, can, we can verify this. So you can see that in the case of FM, uh, we have a lot of different uh, diffraction peaks occurring, uh, regardless of whether we're irradiating the beam parallel or perpendicular to the shearing direction. Whereas in the case of the SHM, uh, if, we're, if the beam is parallel to the, to the uh, shearing direction, we get predominance of H0L peaks, which indicates that we, are, we have aligned our crystal along their B axis, which is also their fast transport axis. Uh, perpendicular to the shearing direction, uh, we have the uh, predominance of uh, zero uh, KL peaks, uh, which is in correspondence to what we see in the cross-polarized microscopy image. So the main data here, you can see that the normal solution shearing gives us very poor uniformity. But as we move from flat microfluidic channel to SGM to SHM, the uniformly uh, improves. You can see that SHM has much better uniformly compared to the other, other uh, three processes. So you can see that the mobility that the uniformly has improved, the average mobility has improved. Uh, and you can see that the other uh, properties such as threshold voltage, uh, on-off ratio, and also sub-threshold swing uh, has also improved in their uniformity. Uh, the system also works with, uh, not only with the small molecules, but also with a small molecule polymer blend system. You can see that the average uh, mobility has improved and also the uniformity has improved. So uh, this system not works with multiple, would more work with multiple material systems. So this is a comparison of our work to that of the previous works. Uh, I've only compared works that were, that have characterized more than 10 devices. You can see that our mobility and uniformity is relatively uh, good compared to that of the others. Now with the remaining 10 minutes, uh, I will uh, focus 
my talk on the metal organic frameworks. So uh, these materials have a lot of really interesting applications like field effect transistors, uh, electrodes for energy devices, uh, gas sensing or biosensing. And to enable these applications, we need thin films. Uh, and the current method to generate thin films is using either drop casting or interfacial reaction or layer by layer synthesis. But generally these are not large area scalable and they're uh, generally slow in nature. And it's, it's also difficult to control their, the properties of the thin film. So generally uh, they're slow and the, they're not large area scalable. Also, it's very difficult to embed nanocatalysts during thin film synthesis. So to address these challenges, uh, we have used, utilized our comic process that I've mentioned previously to generate a large area thin film of conductive moth. So here we have used these microfluidic channels as reactors or mixers. So if, if you can see here, we have injected metal precursor along one end and we have injected uh, ligand along the other direction. And then we have mixed these within the microfluidic channel. And then down the line, we have also injected a uh, platinum precursor. And with uh, a base, uh, these platinum gets reduced. And, and basically what happens is that the nanoparticles get embedded within the pores of the, of the of crystals. And as the solution uh, flows out, uh, because we have a heated substrate, the thin film grows. So the advantage of this is that this is relatively fast, large area scalable. And the synthesis, the decoration of catalyst and the thin film formation are all occurring uh, simultaneously. So this is a very uh, one step, very uh, effective and efficient way to generate uh, thin film over a large area. So here I told you that the microfluidic channels are used to mix different compounds, to, to mix different solutions. So mixing efficiency now becomes very important. So to quantify mixing efficiency, we use a concept known as uh, Shannon entropy, uh, where the equation is listed here. Basically, Shannon entropy is maximum when we have equal number of each type of particle. So by properly designing the microfluidic channels, and here's a simulation of the cross section, we can mix two different or three different particles uh, efficiently. So this was the design that we used. And you can see that compared to that of the solution sharing technique, our technique generates a relatively uniform uh, film without the presence of aggregates. Uh, you can see that using the SM images, the, the, the particles are very close packed and the roughness uh, is on the order of three nanometers. Whereas, compare, whereas if you use drop casting or conventional shearing, roughness is uh, very high compare, in comparison. Also the resistance, the uniformity in resistance is very uh, much better compared to that of the conventional technique. And also you can see that we can precisely control the thickness by controlling the solution shearing rate. So we can go from 70 down to 30 nanometers. Also we see uh, what's interesting here is that if we just um, do this microfluidic, if we just collect the solution from the microfluidic and dry it, we don't get crystallization. Only after solution shearing, we get crystallization, which means that we need that heated substrate uh, to be able to crystallize a thin film. And also here we see that the embedding of platinum, which is this red curve, the crystal, the X-ray diffraction pattern is very similar, which means that the embedding of platinum doesn't change the, the crystal structure of the moth. So this is the cryotime images. You can see that in the middle here, uh, if we embed the platinum nano catalyst, you can see these dark spots uh, inside of the, the MOF pores. Uh, this is confirmed by this integrated intensity plot. And also if we don't have the platinum, we see a greater contrast uh, between uh, where the pores are and where the MOF is. So this uh, visually confirms that we have indeed 
a crystallized small uh, accurately. And also we, we were able to embed the platinum particles. And also uh, we collaborated with Professor Ildo Kim, uh, who is also in our department, uh, who conducted uh, gas sensing for us. And we found out that compared to that of the bulk sample, our film has a better sensitivity, uh, a low concentration of nitrogen oxide. And also uh, if we, with the platinum embedment, the, the, the improved, we get improved sensitivity. And we can see that our sensor was uh, at low concentration, uh, had a very good performance compared to that of other two-dimensional uh, materials. This is another, uh, we synthesized another type of MOF, nickel 3 HITP. Here we used uh, solution shearing to generate a thin film of the MOF. And then after, pour, after this post-treatment, we get crystallization to occur. The advantage of this process is that we can do this at relatively low temperature at 60 degrees. So the XPS images confirm that we are indeed uh, crystallizing after the, uh, the post-treatment. So this is post-treatment in a base solution, uh, which enables uh, the coordination bonding to occur. So we can again see that we can have, we can synthesize the thin film over a large area. The thickness of the film can be, can again be controlled. Here we can control it down to uh, 10 nanometers from anywhere between 70 to 10 nanometers. And the roughness stays relatively constant. And also by controlling the thickness, we can control the transmittance and the sheet resistance. So for various applications, uh, we can tune these two. Uh, properties. And because we can process this uh, MOF at a relatively low temperature, we can also place these on flexible substrates. So we have uh, shown that we can use this for wearable gas sensing applications. And also because you can make these films very thin, uh, they're not as prone to um, damage under bending. So we can see that we're bending this film and the resistance uh, changes negligibly. Also, uh, in the case of this MOF, uh, this is sensitive to hydrogen sulfide. We see that compared to that of the bulk, uh, this film has much better sensitivity. Uh, it also works in humid air. And also after bending, it does degrade, the, the performance degrades a, a little bit, uh, but it's still, uh, this is still uh, negligible, uh, insignificant. Uh, change in the, in the performance. So with that, I would like to conclude this talk. Uh, I would like to conclude by acknowledging uh, some of my collaborators. Firstly, I would like to uh, thank Professor Ildo Kim's group for uh, characterizing the gas sensors for us. And also Professor Nam at Seoul National University who conducted uh, fluid dynamic simulations also, I would like to thank my uh, students and the students of my collaborators for, for these research. Uh, thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, uh, Professor Park, there is actually two questions in the chatting. Can you read the uh, questions? Uh, yes. Yes. So the first question is, what would happen if the current uh, chaotic flow changes to turbulent flow? So in terms of mixing, um, I think turbulent flow is also a very effective. Uh, that's because we have very uh, stochastic motion of the fluid. So that would mean that we have very good uh, advective uh, advection within the fluid. But it's very difficult to make uh, turbulent flow in a small area microfluidic channel. So that's why we were, we have used chaotic flow, which acts kind of like a turbulent flow in terms of its mixing. Um, so that's, that, so that was the reason. So to answer your question, the turbulent flow would also be very effective in mixing. Uh, in terms of the second question,
So the second question is, um, how does the mechanical property change uh, if we use uh, crystallized uh, crystals? So if you're, if you're trying to make flexible devices that have to withstand very high bending radius or very low bending radius, uh, certainly amorphous or polymers are, are better suited. Um, because the, if you have large crystals, they are going to be a little bit more prone to be uh, breaking. So I think you have to choose the, the application uh, wisely. Uh, in terms, so if we use these polymer blend, a uh, polymer uh, small molecule blend system, or the small molecules, they generally will have a higher mobility. So again, uh, it depends on the application that you choose. Uh, another question is, so straining the crystallized film, I haven't done uh, that type of study. Uh, it is able to withstand uh, some degree of bending, but I haven't actually laterally stretched the films. Uh, but MOF won't, won't be able to withstand lateral stretching. It, it's relatively brittle. Uh, it's, it's able to withstand bending because we're able to make such a thin film. But generally, um, MOF or the organic uh, small molecules uh, are not uh, very good at uh, withst withstanding uh, lateral strains. Is that good enough or are there any other questions? Okay, thank you for the uh, answering. I think I saw your paper, actually it's blind uh, competition in Samsung Human Tech. Uh, so I didn't expect it to your paper and uh, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also think uh, quick thought is uh, maybe if we apply proper uh, I mean, substrate or something then Maybe you can ha have some more flexibility or things. And also I see uh, lots of collaborative uh, possibility in collaboration with Professor Lee and Professor Chen. So thank you very much for the uh, interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very willing to take their materials and apply my uh, process to make uh, uh, improve their device. So I'm very open to uh, collaboration with, uh, with NTU professors at NTU. So yeah. Thank you very much.